Good afternoon, everybody. Today we are talking about a couple of uh, infectious agents that didn't fit in with the rest of the course, but which are nonetheless really interesting. And there, there are three different ones we're going to talk about today. And one good way of organizing this lecture is to ask the question, what is the minimum genome size needed to sustain an infectious agent? We've talked about viruses with really big genomes in this course, and some with smaller ones, about 1.7 kb. But today we're going to get even smaller, and in fact, we're going to see if you could have an infectious agent that doesn't even have a genome. And the agents we're going to talk about today really address uh, this question. We're going to talk about viroids, satellites, and prions or prions, depending on how you want to say it. How do you say it, Dr. Silverstein? Tomato. Tomato. Thank you. Prions or, let's see, how do I feel today? Like a prion or a prion? A prion. Today we'll call it prions. Uh, they don't fit into any of the schemes we have to organize viruses, as you will see. We're going to talk about viroids, which are major plant pathogens. Uh, we're going to talk about satellites, not the kind orbiting around Earth, but rather the infectious kind, some uh, of which are associated with human disease one in particular. And then we're going to talk about prions, which cause very serious, although rare, uh, fatal dementias in people and in other animals. So let's start with viroids. These are really interesting. These are infectious entities that are just composed of RNA. They have no protein coat. Uh, they do get from host to host, as you will see. No receptors are needed. Viroids. And there is a database that lists all of these, shown here. And I just checked the other day. There are 1,742 different viroid sequences uh, in this database. So probably just a fraction of the total ones that are out there. So these are small RNAs that are not caps encapsidated. They don't have a coat on them of any kind. They don't have a membrane. They don't have a protein shell. The RNA is circular and single-stranded and very, very short. And when you put these into plants, they replicate. The RNAs replicate. When you mechanically introduce them, and in nature, presumably, they get introduced in other ways as well. They're classified in two families, pospivoroidae. Pospivoroid, so you notice, instead of viridae, which would be a family of viruses, this is viroidae, because these are viroids, pospiviroidae. Um, and avsun viroidae. And that, these are divided in, in a variety of ways based on different properties, but the pospi viroidae replicate in the nucleus of the cell and the avsun viroidae replicate in the chloroplast. Uh, the first viroid discovered, potato spindle tuber viroid. These all have really descriptive names, the best among all the things we've talked about probably so far. Uh, 1967, that's a viroid that caused potatoes to be, sh to be small. Instead of getting a nice big Idaho potato, the farmers were getting these little guys and someone found out that there was a viroid infecting them. And so that's the prototype and since then many, many different ones have been identified. This one is 359 nucleotides long. And again, they don't code for any protein. There are a couple that are even shorter than this. Uh, some of them don't do anything. And if they, all of them did nothing, we wouldn't care about them very much. But many of them are agriculturally very important. They can destroy your crop. And so it's not good to have them in there. And this is an example of what one of them can do to this. Uh, looks like a tomato plant, right? Any gardeners? Is that a tomato plant? Yeah. You're from Detroit, that's why you know tomatoes, right? Nobody else does here. Um, so you take a plant and you grow it up. This is the size of uninoculated plants. And then these were inoculated with viroids of different virulence, which are made in the lab by mutating the viroids. This one has mild virulence, intermediate, and uh, strong virulence. And you can see they stunt the growth 
of the tomato plant. So this is just part of what happens with these when they get into a plant, they stunt its growth, they can make the fruit bad, so it can't be sold, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so here are some of my favorite viroids. The Kadang Kadang coconut viroid, which causes lethal diseases of coconut palms. You can see this very sad looking yellowing uh, coconut palm. So if you like pina coladas, you don't like this viroid particularly. Uh, there's the hop latent viroid, which infects the hop, but this one does not cause any symptoms. And so the beer is unaffected. And then we have apple scar skin viroid, uh, which causes symptoms in apples like this. The, the uh, nice red skin of the apple is blemished. Uh, they taste normal, there's nothing wrong with these. And in fact, you will find these in the supermarket. Uh, there's nothing wrong with selling them. And someday when you do see them, you will remember this course and say, ah, oh, yes, I learned about that. And that's the one thing I remember <laughs> from the course. But many people won't buy those because they don't look good. There's just a couple of them. If you go to that database, you will see a range of that. cucumber and pear and banana viroids, all cool names like this. So these are really neat. They cause this disease, but they don't, call, they don't encode any proteins. As I said, they are uh, single-stranded circular uh, RNA molecules. And RNA now, remember, they're not DNA. They're RNA molecules about this long. Uh, and they have a lot of base pairing in the RNA, as you will see. Um, and that's part of the reason why they can probably move around in nature and not get degraded. They're mostly double-stranded. And uh, if you look at these under the electron microscope, they look like rods, not like single strands of RNA. Uh, these have uh, a very interesting enzymes in them called ribozymes. And this activity of the viroid is essential for their replication. Not all viroids have this, but those that do, it's essential. Uh, and a, a ribozyme, of course, is an RNA that can cleave RNA. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So these are very different from viruses that we've talked about so far in this course. The viruses, I've emphasized a few times, are parasites of the host translation machinery, right? They have to make an mRNA that can be recognized by host ribosomes. But viroids don't make any protein. So they're not parasites of the translation machinery. They're parasites of the host transcription machinery. They, in fact, have to be copied uh, by DNA polymerase, RNA, DNA dependent RNA polymerase is the host as you'll see. So this is an example of the prototypical viroid potato spindle tuber viroid. Uh, that's the way these are abbreviated with a little d for the viroid. And this one you can see is uh, a single stranded RNA and it's, it's called collapsed on itself so it, it's base paired. So all these two sides are, are base pairing with each other. And there are a variety of regions that have been identified experimentally. They're left and right termini. There are regions, if you change them, if you change the base sequence, will affect the pathogenesis of the viroid in the plant. These are obviously lab experiments where you alter the sequence and it affects how much disease. And we saw an example of that earlier, the different effects on, on tomato plant growth. Uh, and then there are central conserved regions, which are found in many other viroids as well. So that's the general scheme. And again, these are, can either be short or slightly longer, and they have different kinds of secondary structures. How do they replicate? Well, they get into the plant cell, and they are replicated by host RNA polymerase too. It's DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. It's the enzyme that usually makes messenger RNA from our DNA. It amazingly can recognize these viroid templates. And uh, so they, these enzymes copy the viroid RNA. They make concatomers, that is, multiple genome units from the viroid. Uh, and then the viroid RNA, in, in some cases, can actually cut those concatomers into single unit lengths. And that's done, again, by a ribozyme. So ribozymes, as I said, are RNAs that can cleave RNA. And these were discovered in, in 1981 and they resulted in a Nobel Prize for that discovery. Uh, they are thought to be remnants of the RNA world. Remember when there was just RNA around and nothing else, and that RNA probably had to cleave itself at some point. It was done by these enzymes that are built into the RNA itself. 
And there's one group of viroids, as we'll see, that have this activity. And their uh, ribozyme is called the hammerhead ribozyme because it folds into a, a, a three-dimensional structure that looks like a hammerhead. And this is, again, a self-cleaving RNA. It's a sequence in the RNA that can cleave itself. Uh, and in fact, some introns can remove themselves from RNA by similar reactions in the absence of proteins. So again, these ribozymes are used to, con to cleave the multimeric structures produced by replication. That'll be obvious to you in a moment. We'll look at a picture. So some, one class of viroids, one of those two families of viroids, has a hammerhead ribozyme, and the other <coughs> does not. It uses host nuclear enzymes to cleave uh, the concatomers uh, that the, virus, vi uh, the viroids make. So here are the POSP viroidi. Uh, these viroids don't have a, a ribozyme encoded in them, or present, I shouldn't say encoded, but present in them, because they don't encode protein. Uh, and these uh, replicate in the nucleus. So they enter the plant, and here's the ribozyme here, shown as a circle, gets into the plant, goes into the nucleus, and there, of course, is where Paul II resides. And Paul's II copies uh, the viroid to make catamers, concatomers. Here you see two unit lengths, so each of these would be a, a viroid in itself. It makes long chains of these. Uh, and then these are cleaved by a, a, a cellular uh, enzyme in this case. They don't have, these ribozymes don't have, uh, ri sorry, these viroids don't have ribozymes. So you can see here in the nucleolus, this concatomer is being cleaved, and then those are ligated to form the new viroids. They get exported, and then they move from cell to cell. You know, plant cells are connected by pipes like this, and the uh, ribozyme, uh, the viroids can move from plant, from cell to cell. So the viroid can enter a single cell and then spread throughout the whole plant. Now, what do you think about this? Here is a circular RNA getting into this cell and it's being copied by Paul II. Does that, does that make you want to say, hey, you said, did I say something that makes this surprising to you before? Do you remember? No, not you. Does that, does that ring a bell? RNA, this is not a virus, viroid RNA being copied by a cell enzyme. What did I tell you way back in the beginning of this course? Do you remember? What? I, I can't hear you. Remember, what did I say about RNAs, viral RNAs? All right, let's give you a clue. A plus strand RNA doesn't have to bring a polymerase in the cell because it can be translated, but a minus strand RNA carries a polymerase in, right? Why? Why does it? Oh, yes, that's an RNA dependent. Why does it have to bring one into the cell with it? Why can't the cell do it? Cell can't do it. I told you that. I, I told you that as a fact. Okay, I said viral RNA can't be copied by cellular enzymes. That's what I want you to remember. But now I'm telling you that it, it can be. Look, this viroid RNA is being copied. It's not by an RNA polymerase. It's by a DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Yeah. It could be that part of the issue is that this is a double-stranded template, but it is RNA. It's not DNA. The normal substrate for this enzyme is double-stranded DNA. That's correct. And it could be that somehow this viroid is mimicking uh, a double-stranded DNA template to some extent, and it's able to be copied. But these are the only substrates that we know of that can be copied. So I guess you didn't remember that. And, but some years, people raise their hand and say, but didn't you tell us that uh, viral RNA couldn't be copied by cell enzymes? So I wanted to just preempt that. But I didn't have to this year. Who knows? Who knows? OK, so this is some exception. But this, of course, is not a virus, so it's something totally different. Uh, the Avsun viroidi have a slightly different replication scheme. They also uh, come in to the plant cell and they go to the chloroplast, not the nucleus, as did the other viroids. And these are the ones with the hammerhead ribozyme. So there you go. This is folded into a structure. You know, I, it doesn't look like a hammerhead to me, but to someone it obviously did. And that's got a ribozyme. So it goes in the chloroplast. Uh, we believe it is copied by a chloroplast polymerase, similar to DNA-dependent RNA polymerase called NEP. Uh, it makes 
concatenomers of the viroid RNA, and then those are cleaved also probably by a cellular enzyme. This thing called PAR-BP33 is a nuclease which is believed to cleave these concatenomers. And so you get single unit length viroids which fold up again into hammerheads, uh, and then those go on again to replicate again to make the right polarity uh, for spreading from cell to cell. So similar replications, different places, and slightly different enzymes involved. So where did they come from? Where do viroids come from? Well, we're not sure, but we think they, they got into our crops in the 20th century uh, when we were just beginning to breed modern day crops. And probably the wild plants that we started with had viroids in them. And they spread and they're, they're here with us to stay. And now, nowadays, uh, much of the world uses the same plants to start all their crops. It's called a monoculture. You know, if you grow corn, you get the same seeds from similar companies. So uh, these are all susceptible to these uh, viroids and probably have them in them. Uh, the, the plant lines are all over the world, as I said. So how do these get into the plants? These are some of the ways mechanical transmission by farm equipment. Just pruning gear has been shown to introduce viroids or just handling them. People touching the plants, even with a glove on, can carry it from plant to plant. Uh, it can go when the leaves of one plant brush against another in a row of tomato plants. It can be transferred that way. And in some cases, insects have even been shown to transfer these viroids uh, from plant to plant. So mechanical ways, the RNA gets on the leaf, maybe there's a break in the leaf, uh, and it gets taken up and infects them. So these are quite serious, and there's a lot of effort devoted to making uh, crops free of them. Unfortunately, there are no drugs that we can use to get rid of them. So if a crop is infected, you have to destroy the crop and make sure that you don't have uh, viroid sequences in whatever you're going to plant. Um, and there are now diagnostics that can be used to detect uh, the viroid. Uh, the way they cause disease is interesting because they don't encode proteins, of course. And this has been a, a bit of a puzzle for many years to sort this out. We think it has to do with small RNAs now, uh, small interfering RNAs. And we think when the viroid gets into plants, uh, some of the viroids are degraded into uh, 21 to 24 nucleotide siRNAs. And these have specific host targets. They target the plant genome and they silence certain plant genes and that's what actually causes the disease symptoms uh, of the viroid. And there's some evidence for this. One is that whenever you have disease in a plant, that correlates with the production of small RNAs. And you can interfere with the production of those small RNAs by mutating the pathogenicity modulating domain, that little piece that I showed you on the left side of the PTSV uh, viroid. If you alter that, you're altering the production of siRNA. So it looks like this is the, the case. Uh, so maybe uh, disease production is an accident. The viroid gets in, and the plant is chopping up the viroid RNA as a sort of immune response, and then the result is that uh, disease results because you're getting silencing of plant genes. OK, so that's viroids. Um, and those are interesting, again, because they don't encode protein. They, don't, they are not encapsidated. Now, the next unusual agent uh, are, is satellites. Um, these are mostly small also. They are single-stranded RNAs, slightly bigger, 500 to 2,000 nucleotides. And, and some are even bigger, as you'll see later. And these do encode proteins. Some of them actually encode proteins, uh, one or two structural proteins. So when they do encode proteins, they're typically structural proteins that encapsidate the satellite. Um, other satellites don't encode any proteins. And they all lack genes needed for replication. All right, so if the satellite does encode a protein, it's, it's always for encapsidation. So in all cases, these uh, satellites need uh, another virus around to supply the proteins required for replication. So they will replicate only in the presence of what we call a helper virus. And the helper virus at the minimum will supply the replication proteins for all the satellites. They're all defective in those. And sometimes they also provide capsid proteins uh, as well. All right, so these are slightly different from viroids. They, encode, they can encode proteins and they're encapsidated. Uh, there are many satellites in plants as well, just like the viroids. 
um, these infection of plants with the satellites causes a very distinct disease which you do not see with the helper virus alone. Okay? So you put helper virus in plants, you get a certain disease, but if you put helper plus satellite, and again the satellite has to have the helper around, you get a different disease with the two of them. So these satellites are not derived from the helper. They have no homology at all with the helper in sequence. They're not defective viruses that are derived from the helper. They're totally independently evolved and they, they somehow evolved uh, in the presence of the helper to require it. Here's a table of some, just to give you a sense of the diversity of these satellites. Um, again, there are a lot of plant uh, satellites, which you can see here, uh, tobacco, and this is listed with the helper virus first and then the satellite that depends on it afterwards, so uh, tobacco necrosis virus is the helper and its satellite is called satellite TNV. Uh, here's another one, panicum mosaic virus, that's a, a kind of a grass, and this is the satellite PMV satellite, another tobacco, bless you. Uh, here is an insect virus and its satellite, here's a corn virus and its satellite. And here's another, this one's a bee virus, chronic bee paralysis virus and its satellite as well. Uh, this is the size of the particle, so you can see these are pretty small particles and that is the size of the uh, satellite genome. And you can see uh, these are all quite large, much larger than viroids of course. And then we do have examples of satellites among animal viruses. Uh, there are satellites called dependoviruses, which are part of the parvoviridae family. So the parvoviridae family has replication competent viruses, but they also have ones that are dependent on, on helpers, and those helpers can be adenoviruses uh, or herpes viruses. These are slightly larger with a bigger genome. Now we have one human satellite virus that we know of, and that's hepatitis delta virus. This is actually an interesting cross, I think, between a viroid and a satellite. It fits all the properties of a satellite, but as you'll see in a moment, it has a lot of features like viroids. The helper virus for this is hepatitis B virus. And when Delta was originally uh, discovered, there was an idea that it made disease caused by hepatitis B virus worse. It made the virus more virulent in people. As you know, hepatitis B causes liver disease, and when it's, when it's established chronically in a person over many years, it can cause uh, liver cancer. And Delta was thought to make it more severe. Whether or not that's true is now not clear. It's a controversial issue. Uh, this is the distribution globally of hepatitis Delta virus. Again, this is a human uh, satellite virus. There are 18 million people infected with the virus globally, and when you are infected, you also have hepatitis B. This virus will not infect you unless hep B is present, because it needs it as the helper. And that's about 5% of the 350 million carriers that we know of globally who carry HBV. Uh, it was originally quite high in Europe, uh, but now the incidence is going down in Europe. Uh, it's, it is very high in the Asia-Pacific region, as you can see here, uh, very high in some countries and, and intermediate levels in others. And again, we don't know the significance of it being together with Hep B in terms of human uh, disease. Uh, this is what the genome looks like. So this should ring a bell. This looks a lot like a viroid. It is a circular, single-stranded RNA molecule which is largely base paired so that it looks like a rod. It looks like a double-stranded RNA. Uh, and it also encodes a ribozyme. It encodes a sequence right here, it's shown as self-cleavage, which allows it to cleave itself. So right here in this self-cleavage area, the RNA gets cut by the activity of the RNA uh, itself. Uh, this genome, unlike a viroid, does encode proteins. It, a, a mRNA is actually produced uh, from the genome and it encodes what's called delta antigen. And there are small and large versions of that shown here. So that's the mRNA, it's polyadenylated. There's the open reading frame for the short. And then uh, the long one is made by an editing of the mRNA. That is a base change uh, right at the termination code on this, not templated, but allows translation to continue and make a longer uh, 
delta antigen. And this is what delta virus looks like. So here on the right is its helper, hepatitis B virus. And you may remember this is an envelope virus with glycoproteins in the envelope, three different sorts of glycoproteins shown here. Within it is a nicosahedral capsid. And within that, of course, is this funny gap, double-stranded DNA genome with a protein and an RNA linked to it. Uh, the delta virus is smaller, as you can see. It is also enveloped, and the envelope contains the hepatitis B virus glycoprotein, so that's one of the functions provided by uh, the HBV is to, is to provide this encapsidation. Uh, the G delta genome itself is shown inside here. It's, it's shown in a helical fashion, and it's bound by delta, small and large delta antigens. The small is coding uh, the RNA, and the large delta is thought to anchor uh, the uh, delta genome to the particle. It could be part of the packaging sequence. So that's why Delta needs HPV to provide this coat. Without HPV, it's, a, it's an RNA and it can't get out of the cell. This RNA, when it gets into cells, so it will bind to receptors, the same receptors that Hep B uses, it will get into the cell, and then it is also replicated by host DNA-dependent RNA polymerase 2, Paul 2, uh, just like the viroids were. So here's the uh, genome RNA that comes in. It's negative-stranded, and it's immediately copied in the nucleus by Paul II, again, which recognizes this uh, as a template, even though all the other viruses we've talked about in this course are not recognized by that enzyme. And the enzyme makes concatamers, just like the viroids. So it makes multiple unit-length long copies. The polymerase just cranks out these, and they get longer and longer. And then they are cleaved at the ribozyme sequence. So the ribozyme is this red portion here. So that's a self-cleaving sequence. It can just cut itself, and you can see one cut going on right there to release a unit length genome, which can be, in some cases, processed to make uh, an mRNA so you can get those delta antigens. Uh, and in some cases, the cut proceeds to make a full length genome. This is a plus strand now, and the plus strand is copied by the same polymerase now to make more minus strands, so they're shown in olive here. Again, by the RNA polymerase II uh, in the nucleus, they're resolved by self-cleavage at the ribozyme site. Those are ligated together, uh, and then these are the new virion. These are the new viroids, which will event, sorry, not viroids, these are the new hepatitis delta genomes that will get packaged into the uh, hepatitis B capsid. So all the replication is carried out by host Paul II, the concatamers are resolved by a ribozyme present in the delta sequence, and that's all very much like the way the, the, the uh, viroids in the plants replicate. The difference here, of course, is that there's an mRNA produced that makes these delta antigens. So this is really a summary of what I've just told you. It's a rather short single-stranded circular RNA. It's a ribozyme. The ribozyme is needed for replication. If you make a base change to knock out the ribozyme activity, that is so it can't cleave itself, this RNA will not replicate. It encodes a protein, the delta antigen, in fact, two of them that encapsidates the genome. And it acquires its envelope as it passes out of the cell by budding, just the way uh, HBV would. So the virion, that's the satellite, we call it the hepatitis delta satellite, comprises the surface antigen of HBV. Uh, those surface glycoproteins and uh, delta antigens. So you can see why it's a hybrid between a satellite and a viroid. It has properties of both. And again, this is the only known human satellite, the only one we're aware of. There may be more that we haven't discovered, but it's an interesting satellite that goes along with hep B, uh, hepatitis B virus. Now, in the last few years, another class of viruses, if you will, ha has been discovered. And these are called virophages. I really dislike this name, and you'll see why in a moment. Uh, the name, of course, is derived from bacteriophage. Am I dying? I'm dying? No. The batteries. Yep, they're dead.
Is that better? You say, I, don't, I never really die, I'm a vampire. In fact. All right, uh, virophages. Our, the name comes from bacteriophage. And I don't think I ever told you this, but bacteriophage comes from the Greek to eat. So bacteriophage was named because it was thought that they ate bacteria. Uh, and then virophage is something that eats viruses. Okay, that's what, I think it was coined by a couple of, a couple of French uh, virologists. Maybe that explains it. Um, these are circular, double-stranded DNA viruses with icosahedral capsids. They are satellites because they only replicate in cells that are infected with another virus, and these are giant DNA-containing viruses. All right, uh, Mimi virus is one of them that we have mentioned so far in this course. So these virophages replicate only in cells infected with big viruses. And the reason they were called virophages is because they interfere with the replication of the helper. So the satellites that I told you about just before, they don't interfere with the helper virus multiplication. They coexist and they, they do not, but this one decreases substantially the yields of the helper virus. So they call it virophages. I'm not sure if that deserves a distinction on itself, but that's the name. I mean, I also don't like virus eater, uh, viruses eating viruses, because it's not, obviously. It's just interfering uh, with the replication. There are a bunch of these virophages that have been discovered so far. Here's a table of them. And um, you can see they have interesting names. Well, at least the ones isolated in Europe are given interesting names. The one that we isolated here in the US are pretty boring. Um, but this Sputnik was isolated from a cooling tower in Paris, France, and the virus that is the helper for Sputnik is called, uh, it's Mimi virus. It's a virus that infects amoeba, and that's the amoeba host, and that's the size of the Sputnik genome, and encodes 21 proteins, so quite a few proteins. Here's another one, Ma, Ma virus, uh, isolated off of Texas. Its um, virus helper is the Cafeteria renbergensis virus. And Cafeteria renbergensis is a ma marine phagotrophic flagellate. It's a small organism living in the oceans that eat other things. And we have the organic lake uh, virophage, which is a very high salt lake in Antarctica. And the host, the helper for that is not quite identified, but uh, possibly those DN those, that helper infects algae. And then this is Sputnik 2. Uh, isolated from the contact lens fluid of a patient in France with keratitis. So you know what happens here? If you, do, if you don't put the right solution in your contact lens, if you use tap water to wash your contact lenses, you can get an amoeba infection, all right? So don't do that. And they, they got the amoeba out of this, and then they found uh, Sputnik virus in it as well. And the, the, uh, they also found the helper virus, which they called lentille virus. How clever the French lens virus, right? And uh, the host is, an, is another amoeba. And then we have the boring American viruses, Yellowstone Lake uh, virophage, one, two, three, and four. And we're not sure who the helpers and the hosts are for those. And then another one from uh, Antarctica. See, these have been found all over the world. And uh, all these dots, the dots represent some of the uh, isolations on this table, like Sputnik here in France. But a lot of them are just from sequences. I don't know if you know this, but Craig Venter, you know, he's a very wealthy guy. He owns a big yacht, and he sails around the world often in this yacht. And he did this a number of years ago and sampled the ocean every so often. He'd put a tube in and take out 200 liters of water and then filter it, and he sequenced it. And all, he sequenced all the oceans, and there's actually a data set of all his sequences you can find online. And you can mine this data set, and you can find lots of virophages in, in those data, uh, buried in with you know, viruses and bacteria of all sorts. So quite interesting stuff. So the sequences are all over the place. So these are probably quite ubiquitous and quite interesting. Uh, here's how they work in terms of Mimi virus. So here is a cell infected with a Mimi virus. Here are the Mimi virus particles. Remember, these are huge. These are like 800 nanometers in diameter. They, they wouldn't pass through a 0.2 micron filter. Remember the original definition of viruses. And you can see them in light, by the light microscope. This is, happens to be an EM. 
but you can see these in the light microscope, they're so big. And within Mimi virus infected amoeba, there are factories, remember? Factories are where virus particles are assembled. The viruses like to do that. And here we have the um, viral phages multiplying in those factories. Those are the small circles. They're much smaller than Mimi virus. And so they replicate in the actual factory where Mimi virus is replicating, and they inhibit the production of Mimi virus by about 70%, so a substantial effect. And they cause the particles that are made to be defective. And these are some electron micrographs of the crazy particles that are made. So here's a normal looking uh, Mimi virus on the upper left. Look at this one, it just has layers and layers of what looks like membranes or protein on it. This one's wrapped up in it. Look at this one here too. And then these, these actually have virophages within them. This is a Mimi virus particle full of little virophages. So this is part of the reason why these interfere with uh, the replication of these big viruses. Just a few words on a couple of the specific virophages. One of them is called Mavirus, which infects a giant virus, which in turn infects an organism called Cafeteria renbergensis, and this is a marine phagotropic flagellate. And a, a diagram of this flagellate is shown in the upper right here. This is one of the most abundant forms of life in the sea, and it basically eats everything that it can, whatever it can phagocytose, it eats, and that's why it's called cafeteria. And uh, my virus is a satellite that only infects cafeteria cells that are also infected with the giant virus of that organism. Another interesting virophage is the organic lake virophage. This virophage infects cells that are infected with the giant virus phycodenoviruses. And these viruses in turn infect host cells that are algae. And these uh, virophages are believed to play important roles in the ecology of Organic Lake, which is down in Antarctica. And this is a lake that doesn't get a lot of sunlight all year, and there are algae growing in it. And it's thought that perhaps the Organic Lake virophages mute the killing effects of the phycodenoviruses and allow the algae to survive uh, and perhaps prolong them when there isn't much light around. So it keeps their numbers up so that when the light goes out, which it does many months of the year, uh, the algae are able to survive. That's just a hypothesis based on the fact that this virophage, again, inhibits the replication of phycodenoviruses in the algae and prevents them from killing them. Now, these virophages are also thought to be gene exchangers. That is, they can carry genes from one helper virus infected cell to another. And the reason we think this is because if you look at the genome sequence of these virophages, you can find genes that are also present in the helper virus, suggesting that they're exchanging genes. So that would be a very important role to play because, as you know, gene exchange, lateral or horizontal gene exchange among organisms, is an important way to have diversity. So these virophages probably have big impacts on various communities through this kind of gene exchange and also uh, on the kind of communities in Organic Lake, as I've just described. So virophages are much like satellites except they're, they're much bigger than the satellites we just talked about, and they also inhibit production of the helper virus. The other satellites we talked about don't do that. So that's a unique feature of virophages. Now the third interesting or unusual infectious agent that we're going to talk about today are prions. These are infectious proteins and they have no nucleic acid at all. So it shows that you can be an infectious agent and you can replicate without having a genome. Prions are always in the news. Uh, you will hear about BSE or mad cow disease, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, scrapie kuru, chronic wasting disease of deer and elk. We'll touch upon each of these today. And Stan Prusiner, who was instrumental in having the prion hypothesis scientifically accepted, he won the Nobel Prize in medicine for that in 1997. And here at the bottom of the slide, is a road sign somewhere in the world, Prion Road. And I would just wonder if it was called that before or after Stan Prusiner coined that phrase, 
how would you like to live on prion road? Prions cause in animals what are known as transmissible spongy form encephalopathies, and we'll abbreviate that as TSE because it's a mouthful. Let's take it apart. An encephalopathy is a disease of the brain. Uh, the spongy form part comes from the pathology these proteins cause in the central nervous system. We'll look at that in a moment. Prions are basically infectious agents without genomes. They cause fatal neurodegenerative disorders of mammals. And thousands of humans are diagnosed globally with these prion infections, or TSEs, each year. About 1% of those arise by infection, and we'll talk about how the others arise as well. Uh, and by 2002, 120 humans had contracted a form of Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, which again is a TSE, from eating meat from animals, cows in particular, cows who had BSE, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, or mad cow disease. So these are some of the TSE diseases of animals and humans. Bo bovine spongiform encephalopathy, BSE, chronic wasting disease of deer, elk, and moose, exotic ungulate encephalopathy, feline spongiform encephalopathy, scrapie, which is a disease of sheep and goats, and transmissible mink encephalopathy. In humans, the TSEs are called Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, fatal familial insomnia, gerstmann straussler syndrome, Kuru, and variant CJD. That's variant CJD is caused by uh, eating meat from a cow with BSE. Of all the lectures this year, this is the one that really taxes our, ab our ability to pronounce uh, complex words, I think. So spongiform in the TSE name uh, comes from the fact that the infected brain has sponge-like holes throughout it. And all of these TSEs are characterized by psychomotor dysfunction, and the symptoms can vary depending on where the brain is being damaged by the prion, and that varies according to the disease. Each, each has its own kind of symptoms and pathology. So here is the section of a brain from an animal with a TSE, and you can see the holes in the section. So these uh, uh, are neurons and some other cells in here, and this should be a solid sheet of cells, and the holes are the spongy form appearance caused again by the uh, multiplication of these pathogenic prion proteins. Now, TSEs were first recognized because of a disease in sheep called scrapie. And this was a disease known for many years, you can see in European sheep for over 250 years, uh, where the sheep rubbed themselves on fences, hence the farmers called it scrapie. It was characterized by motor disturbances, trembling, tremblant du mouton. The sheep would undergo uncontrollable trembling. They would get paralyzed, they would lose weight, and eventually they would die in uh, four to six weeks. In some countries, this is an endemic disease to this day. In the UK, for example, 1% of sheep uh, develop scrapie every year. And this is what a sheep looks like, which has scrapie. It's not a very happy looking sheep, as you can see. It does not walk well, which you can, of course, get from this picture. But you can see where the sheep has rubbed against fences, uh, removing its wool coat. So that's scrapie. Now, sheep farmers were the first to figure out that this infect, uh, this scrapie disease was, in fact, a, uh, an infectious agent. You notice that animals could transmit the disease to healthy herds. So if you got a, a diseased sheep from another farmer, from another farm, and put it on your farm, your sheep would get the disease. In 1939, the first experiments were done to show that if you ground up the brain of a sheep with scrapie and passed it through a filter which would only pass a virus, a 0.2 micron filter, that extract could, when injected into a new sheep, cause scrapie in the new sheep. And in, because of those kinds of experiments, then taking the brain of an affected animal, grinding it up, filtering it, and putting it into another animal, we could start to do experiments. And so we found that the agent 
could pass through a filter, and of course that suggested it might be a virus, but it was unusually resistant to ultraviolet light, ionizing radiation, formaldehyde, and in fact, even autoclaving would not inactivate the infectivity. So at some point, uh, investigators concluded that it didn't have nucleic acid in it, and it was clearly not a typical infectious agent. Here is one of the experimental findings that indicated that the scrapey agent was not a virus. This is an, in, an infectivity inactivation curve. We're looking at the molecular weight of nucleic acid on the y-axis and the dose uh, in RADS were, were irradiating uh, these agents with um, radiation. And on this graph are a variety of viruses. You can see herpes and vaccinia, phages of various sorts, polyoma, SV40. Those are the DNA viruses. And on the lower uh, line are RNA viruses, yellow fever, Newcastle disease virus, HIV. And what you can see is as you give each virus, <clears throat> so the way that the experiment is done, you irradiate the virus with different amounts of radiation, and you find how much is needed to inactivate infectivity. And what you see for the DNA viruses, the big DNA viruses are big targets for radiation. And so they inactivate at low doses. But as the genome gets smaller, the target size is smaller. It takes more radiation to inactivate it. And the same goes from the, for the RNA viruses from big to small genomes. And the scrapie agent falls way down in the lower right of this, of this line. So you can see it's more resistant than either DNA or RNA viruses, and it's, it takes a lot of ionizing radiation to inactivate it. This was one of the experiments that suggested that uh, these prions did not have nucleic acids in them. Well, a lot of people didn't believe that for many years, uh, and it took the persistence of Stanley Prusiner to eventually convince people. Uh, all the human and animal TSEs have the same sort of histochemical abnormalities, defects, in plasma mem membrane formation. This is if you look in the brains of infected animals. Uh, vacua vacuolation of neurons, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, these are all different cell types in the brain, of course. The formation of vacuoles in them, loss of neurons. Neurons disappear. The spongy form appearance, which we looked at, and the accumulation of glial fibrillary acidic protein in clumps and amyloidosis, fibrils are formed of amyloid precursor protein. That's, this doesn't happen in every case, but it's in about 10% of them. Uh, so you can detect the agent of these TSEs in homogenates, as I said, for sheep. You can do that with other animals as well. If you have a cow with BSE, you can grind up its brain and show that if you inject that into other animals, it will cause disease. And when you do that, uh, you end up with these typical uh, symptoms of of a TSE, cerebellar ataxia, difficulty walking, dementia, and death eventually. And uh, depending on how you inject the or feed the virus to the animal, it first accumulates in lymphoreticular and secretory organs and then spreads to the CNS. So we it goes from the gut to the CNS, for example, and we, we don't exactly know how that happens. Of course, in the CNS, again, the, past, the pathology includes astrocytosis, vacuolization, and loss of neurons. Interestingly, there's no immune response. There's no inflammation, there's no antibody response, and there's no cellular response. So the body or the host that receives one of these prion preparations regards it as self. TSEs are typically undetected before the symptoms develop. Again, the motor dysfunctions, the dementias, etc. You, you don't know anything until suddenly the, you have an onset of those, and then uh, at that point it's too late to treat. Um, there's no way to alleviate the symptoms, and so it, all of these are invariably fatal. But even if we could diagnose these earlier, and the only way you could would be to screen the population on a regular basis, which is not really acceptable, we couldn't treat them. We have no way of, of uh, treating these diseases. So back in the 60s, an investigator named Griffith suggested that TSEs were in fact protein only. And in 1981, Stanley Prusiner found the infectious protein complexes in the brains of sheep that had scrapie. He purified this protein and he transmitted it to animals 
and showed that the purified protein is enough to cause the disease. And he called the agent a prion, a proteinaceous and infectious particle. So he coined that phrase. Uh, and I, as I said, he, meet, he met a lot of resistance. A lot of people felt there was a nucleic acid in it, but it was just hard to pick up. But now it's quite clear that all you need is the prion protein in order to cause the disease. You can express the protein and get it to misfold and then inject it into animals and it will cause disease. No nucleic acid is needed. Of course, the protein is encoded by a gene in the host. It's called the PRNP gene, the prion protein gene. And that protein, that gene, is essential for the pathogenesis of TSE. All right. So our view of prions is as follows. We have in all of us mammals, we have a gene, PRNP, that produces or encodes a protein called PRPC. And this is a normal protein in our cells that has a function in neurons. It's predominantly on the outer surface of neurons. It's GPI linked. But there is an abnormal conformational form of this protein, which, when you introduce it into an organism, causes the PRPC, the normal PRPC, to convert to the pathogenic conformation. And it's called PRPSC because Scrapey was the first animal in which this was figured out. So PRPSC is the abnormal conformation of the protein. PRPC is the normal cellular conformation. So if you take PRPSC and inject it into an animal, it will cause conversion of the PRPC to the pathogenic form, and that causes the disease. So what you inject itself is not sufficient to cause disease. Only when it converts your normal PRPC into an abnormally folded protein will that result in disease. So it's sort of like an infection and replication. The infectious agent is templating itself onto your normal protein and causing them to misfold. So here's a graphical depiction of that process. So here uh, the top is, is a diagram of the normal cellular form of PRP, PRPC, and its structure is on the right here, and you can see it has a couple of alpha helices and some beta strands. And if you take this protein and digest it with proteinase K, which is an enzyme that digests proteins, that enzyme will completely digest the um, protein into bits. Now, if you add to PRPC some PRPSC, the PRPC will be conformationally changed to PRPSC, and PRPSC looks like this. On the right is its structure, and it looks very different. As you can see, it's a lot of beta sheet conformation, and as a consequence, PRPSC is highly resistant to digestion with proteinase K. In fact, the enzyme only clips off the end terminus. And this assay, treating uh, proteins with proteinase K and looking to see if it was degraded or resistant to the enzyme was an early assay uh, for whether an animal extract contained the normal protein PRPC or the pathogenic one PRPSC. All right, so this is the structural change that occurs from the normal protein to the pathogenic one. We don't know why this happens. We don't know why it's catalyzed by pathogenic proteins. Basically, if you take this pathogenic form of the protein and add it to the normal form, it will cause the normal form to misfold to resemble the pathogenic form. This is a really unusual reaction, and we don't understand it, but that's the basis for the pathogenesis. Uh, a little more information about why we think the prion hypothesis is true. First of all, if you delete both copies of the PRNP gene in mice, again, that's the gene encoding for the PRP protein, C, the normal cellular form, these mice are resistant to infection. If you infect them with PRPSC, they will not get TSEs. You have to have the gene in the animal in order to develop the TSE. And again, that's because the infecting protein has to change all of, or a lot of our endogenous PRPC into PRPSC. So that was an important experiment to show that animals without the PRNP gene are resistant to infection. Uh, so you can infect an experimental animal by adding or injecting PRPSC into them. Animals will also get TSEs uh, by rare mutations, as we'll talk about in a moment, the PRNP gene. And in fact, only one amino acid change 
in the PRNP gene, which you could inherit from your parents. It's enough to cause spontaneous uh, misfolding to PRPSC. So if you introduce PRPSC into an animal uh, by feeding or injecting, or if the animal develops TSC by mutation, eventually the PRPSC accumulates in the central nervous system, and that's what leads to the symptoms of the TSC. Uh, there are three types of spongiform encephalopathies that I want to tell you about. There is an infectious or transmissible form, uh, there is a familial form, and there is a sporadic form. And no matter how the disease develops by either of these three routes, you can take an extract of the brain of the animal and transmit the disease to another animal by inoculating the protein. So in other words, these three forms of TSC all give rise to PRPSC, which is infectious. All right, so often in nature, TSC agents appear spontaneously, and then they can be transmitted as well, so by eating an infected animal. Let's talk about some human TSEs. First, the infectious or uh, transmissible ones. Uh, there is Kuru, which we'll talk about in a moment. This is a disease of a specific people in New Guinea. Uh, then uh, there has been uh, iatrogenic spread of, a TS, of TSEs by transplantation of infected corneas, by injection of people with hormones that have been uh, purified from human blood or by transfusion, all from patients with CJD. So in other words, a patient uh, dies and they don't know that they had CJD, their corneas are taken for transplant, they're given to another patient, uh, and then those um, corneas are contaminated with, t with prions, with pathogenic prions, and they cause a TSC in the recipient. Uh, BSC is another um, kind of TSC, which occurs in cattle. We'll talk about how that happens, but again, it's, it was caused it was induced in the cattle by feeding them the carcasses of infected animals that had scrapie. And then the humans who ate the cattle with BSC developed a variant Creutzfeldt-Jakob, a new kind of disease different from CJD. It had different incubation times and different pathology, and that was acquired by eating BSC beef. All right, Kuru is a TSC. It's a fatal TSC found in the four people of New Guinea over here. Here's uh, Australia, and New Guinea's right north of it. Uh, this is a disease with a 30-year incubation period, and a virologist, Carlton Gaidusek, went to study it in the four people a number of years ago. He wanted to understand why this disease was developing. No one understood it. And what he found was that it happened mainly in women and children, and it occurred because they ate the brains of people who died. So if someone would die in the, in the tribe, uh, the brain would be fed to women and children who were relatives of the deceased, and this spread the infection. And Gaidusek said to them, you have to stop doing this ritual cannibalism, and they, they listened to him, and they stopped, and eventually Guru disappeared from uh, the four people. So what we think happened is many years ago, one of the four people probably developed a TSE, either spontaneously or by having a mutation in the PRNP gene, that person died and then his or her brain was fed to women and children who then acquired the TSC and then when they died it was passed on and so forth and so forth. Uh, in cows the disease bovine spongiform encephalopathy was caused by feeding cows uh, ground up animals. So here's a cow with BSC. Uh, they have difficulty walking, um, they fall over uh, often, um, they, they act as if they're in a stupor, and this is what BSC or mal mad cow disease is, is like. So in, the, in many countries, cows are fed meat in order to make them gain weight quicker. As you know, cows are vegetarians, but if you feed them only vegetables, they don't grow so quickly, and if you feed them meat, they grow faster. And they're fed processed animal byproducts, and for many years, this wasn't a problem and in, in, the, in these byproducts are ground up sheep which have scrapie but it wasn't a problem until the 1970s when the method of preparing this meat and bone meal as it's called changed and the change in the method allowed scrapie proteins to survive and be fed to cows so the cows began to develop uh, mad cow disease 
which is a TSE, and that disease in cows went way down when animal byproduct feeding stopped. And we have very, very good evidence that humans eating BSE-infected beef developed TSEs, and this TSE is called the variant Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. So here's the epidemiological curve of the outbreak in cows, in orange, and in humans in blue. And these, in, in all, about 1 to 2 million cattle were infected with prions by feeding them these uh, meat supplements from infected animals. In cows, the incubation time of this TSC is about five years, but you slaughter them before the symptoms are evident. And so this is why uh, the meat, the infected meat, got into the human food chain. So the incidence of BSC began to rise uh, in the uh, early 80s, and very soon it was realized that this was probably a consequence of feeding them the meat and bone meal, so a ban on the meat and bone meal was instituted. But since the disease has such a long incubation period, uh, the incidence didn't peak until the 90s, at which point it started to go down. And then eventually, a total ban on feeding cows mechanically recovered meat uh, was instituted, and then uh, now the, the incidence of BSE in cows is very low, but it's not non-existence. There's still sporadic uh, BSE, which is arises in cows, as we'll talk about in a moment. So some of these early infected cows were eaten by people, and that disease had a long incubation period, and in the 90s, late 90s, mid-90s, mid the incidence in people began to rise. You see the peak here in 99, and then it went back down. So this, this outbreak is over in the UK but it was clearly caused by eating uh, contaminated meat. Now we still find cases of BSE in cattle. And last year, the day after I gave this lecture to the virology course, a number of students emailed me and said, did you see the article in the paper that was a case of BSE in a cow in California? And in 2003, there were 1,390 uh, cows reported to have a BSC. These are not from feeding the cows meat and bone meal. It's probably sporadic, where the protein spontaneously misfolds. There are no mutations that predispose the protein to misfolding. It just spontaneously misfolds. We don't know why. And that causes uh, PRPSC to be formed. And then that, of course, triggers the formation of more PRPSC. So we really are concerned about the food supply, but we don't do a good job of testing slaughtered cattle for uh, prions, only less than 2% of the slaughtered cattle, these are cows slaughtered for meat, are tested for prions, so it could easily get into the food chain. Now the incidence is very low, so uh, it's a very rare disease and not likely to happen as long as the, the numbers don't go up. We have diagnostic tests that we use to do this, to look in cattle, but again we don't screen many of them. Uh, we, we are looking for drugs that block the accumulation of prions and in uh, cultured cells, and if these are found, and there are some, uh, these could be tested in animals to see if you could, for example, if you could diagnose a cow early on, you could treat it with the drug to prevent uh, the multiplication of the pathogenic protein. So that's infectious uh, TSEs, where you consume a protein or you receive a transplant of an organ which is contaminated, and then you develop a TSC. Sporadic uh, CJD. Uh, is one in which uh, you have a normal PRP gene and here the disease just appears uh, and uh, it's sporadic because as I said we think that uh, it's a matter of the protein spontaneously misfolding and this affects somewhere less than 1 million humans globally typically 50 to 7 years of age and that represents 65 percent of the TSE so less than 1 percent is infectious 65 percent is sporadic and the rest is inherited and again, if you have this, if you develop this disease but you don't know it and you donate blood or something, some other product, you can transmit to others and they will get what's called CJD. And we think Kuru may have been established in New Guinea by eating the brain of a person with sporadic CJD, as I mentioned earlier. The familial form, the third form, is an inherited disease. In other words, uh, your parents have a, a mutation in a gene, they pass it on to you you have a mutation in the PRNP gene. These are autosomal dominant mutations, so you only need one copy of the mutated gene. And what happens is the protein begins to misfold at a certain point in your life and you develop a TSE. 
I only need one amino acid change in the prion protein in order to do this. And this is one of the, the genetic diseases that we can screen for. Uh, so you can know if you have a mutation that's going to predispose you to TSE. Uh, not that we can do anything about it at this point because there's no treatment, as I said. And again, if you have this gene mutation and if you're developing, you can have infectious prions in you before you develop symptoms and you can transmit them to others. And that's how CJD is obtained. So here's a summary of these three TSCs, the infectious, genetic, and sporadic. Uh, we have on the left the PRPC, the normal form of the prion protein. If you ingest or are infected with the pathogenic protein, PRPSC, it will convert your normal PRPC into PRPSC, and that will eventually multiply and cause the TSC. So that's the infectious form, because you're acquiring a protein and it's causing the disease. The genetic form is when you have a mutation in the PRPC gene that predisposes it to misfold and it will become a PRPSC and eventually that will propagate and cause the TSC. And again, the spontaneous disease or sporadic disease results when the PRPC just spontaneously misfolds without any genetic predisposition becomes PRPSC which then propagates as well. And We don't know why the misfolding occurs. We don't understand enough about the biology of this protein to, to know the answer to that. The prions do have a species barrier to transmission. So in other words, typically you have to inoculate diseased brain material. You should take an animal with scrapie you have to put that extract from that brain into a, an animal of the same species in order to cause disease. It's not very efficient if you go, say, from a sheep to a mouse. In other words, the sequences of the prion proteins in the inoculum and the host have to be very similar. And the way we learned this was to make transgenic mice that were given the gene encoding cow prion protein. So these mice now make mouse prion and they make cow prion and they can be efficiently infected with BSE prions, with cow prions. They can't be efficiently infected if they don't have the bovine PRP gene. So in other words, the species barrier, the prion species barrier, is basically the sequence of the PRP protein. There's nothing else that's blocking uh, infection except that you have to match the protein in you with the protein you're being infected with. Now, unfortunately, the bovine prion protein, the PRPSC, has a broad host range. It infects many meat-eating mammals, including humans. And so it's an example of one prion that can overcome the restriction of, on host range of the primary sequence. And this is one of the reasons we're worried about BSE, because if humans eat BSE, PRPSC, they can develop a TSC. There's no, apparently no species barrier between cows and humans. Another interesting TSE is called chronic wasting disease. This is a TSE that affects deer, elk, and moose. And this can be animals that are uh, on farms, behind fences, or wild animals as well. And this is a map uh, which shows where animals with this disease, with this TSE disease, have been found. You can see quite widespread in the U.S. and also up in Canada as well. So the yellow is in the wild population and the gray, the light gray, is in the uh, captive deer, elk, and moose populations. And this is a particular concern for a variety of reasons. First, if you hunt any of these wild animals, you have to be careful because it's possible that if you eat them and they're contaminated with a PRPSC, a prion, you'll develop a TSE. This has never happened, but it is a concern. And so uh, on this website, which is where this information comes from, they have this uh, notice, hunters beware, do not shoot, handle, or consume an elk or deer that is acting abnormally or appears to be sick. When field dressing game, wear rubber gloves and minimize the use of a bone saw to cut through the brain or spinal cord. Minimize contact with and do not consume brain or spinal cord tissues, eyes, spleen, or lymph nodes. Wash hands thoroughly after dressing and processing game meat. So whether this is a real health issue or not is not clear, but I think it's it's not worth taking the chance. 
So what are the frequencies of these prions in these animals? In standing herds, up to 90% of mule deer and 60% of elk have been found uh, to be positive. In wild servants, it can go as high as 15%. So these are just randomly captured deer, uh, mainly by hunters. They're taken and sampled for prions. As I said, we have diagnostic tests for them, up to 15%. And so we are worried, so first of all, how would these spread among deer? So we think one idea is that if the prions are excreted in the feces, for example, it will contaminate the grass, and grass is something that deer and elk like to eat. So one deer passes the prion in its feces, and then another deer eats contaminated grass and picks up the um, infection. Now what about the species barrier? Could these deer prion diseases go to other animals. Well, if you take an extract of brain from an infected deer, you can transmit the disease to cows in the laboratory. So we're worried that cows grazing outside, the fence around cow pastures is pretty low because cows don't jump. Uh, on the other hand, deer can jump very high and they can go over those fences and who knows, they could contaminate the grass in the cow pasture and then the cow might eat the contaminated grass uh, have acquire a TSE by ingesting the prion. And that would introduce the deer TSE into the human food chain. So these are low frequency events, but we're worried about them, understandably. So here's a nice summary of uh, the various TSEs and how we think they originated. These little panels are color-coded by whether we think they're naturally occurring diseases or artificially occurring, that is transmitted by uh, the passing of contaminated material. So uh, we, s one possibility is that chronic wasting disease of deer and elk is a spontaneous disease that occurs spontaneously in those animals, just like spontaneous TSEs occur in humans. It's possibly, and it's most likely also a spontaneous disease in sheep and goats, scrapie. Although it's possible that scrapie was transmitted to deer and elk uh, in the wild by contamination. There's some evidence that transmissible mink encephalopathy uh, was transmitted to mink by feeding them uh, sheep with, uh, with scrapie. And we believe that the disease was transmitted to cows in 1986 uh, by feeding them sheep. Cow meat was fed to a number of different animals. Um, they, the cows were infected and could probably spread it to other cows as well. Uh, they were fed to various uh, animals in zoos as well as house cats. So all of these are artificial transmissions from the cow. And of course it went from the cow to humans. Uh, and some of these infected humans passed the disease on to others by uh, donating blood or body parts, etc. Now, how did it get in people? Probably there is some sporadic, for sure there is sporadic Creutzfeldt-Jakob uh, in humans. It's been suspected since the 1920s when the disease was first described. And that was probably passed on to other humans, again, iatrogenically by uh, transplants, blood products, and so forth. So a very interesting sequence of events. Now, although we've focused on pathogenic prions, there are prions in other species of life, and they don't cause disease. And prions have been identified in various fungi, like Saccharomyces and Podospora. In these organisms, they don't cause disease but they do switch conformations, just like the prions in mammals that go from a cellular form to a scrapie form. There are two different conformations of prions in these yeasts, in these fungi. And we think that the two different conformations can serve different functions depending uh, on uh, the environment that the yeast is being subjected to, for example. So they're switches. The conformational change in these prions proteins are switches that change their functions. And that may help yeast to adapt to different conditions, for example. So it's a really neat way of modifying an organism. And this is a, a list of known and candidate prions. Uh, these are mainly in Saccharomyces and um, related yeasts. So here's the mammalian prions we've been talking about, which has a normal function. And when it switches to the prion state, it causes neurodegeneration and death. But these yeast proteins have a prion state which is not pathogenic. So the URE2 uh, gene, for example, uh, has a prion state and normally 
it represses transcription and when it switches to the prion state it allows indiscriminate utilization indiscriminate utilization of nitrogen um, here's another one SWE1 which is a transcriptional regulator when it switches to the prion state again a conformational al uh, altered state of the protein uh, the protein allows altered carbon source utilization so the one protein can to do two totally different things depending on the state the conformational state these are prions they switch conformations but in this case they do good things in either case and they probably allow the organisms to respond to various environmental conditions so it's tempting to speculate that these prion proteins evolved a long time ago way before mammals were on earth and then mammals inherited them and for some reason the switch in the mammal is leading to a pathogenic state and which is of course very different which, from which happens in these more primitive cells so it, it, undoubtedly a very interesting pr set of proteins that can switch states in this way and indeed a lot of interesting work yet to be done to understand the hows and the whys.